Down, down here. And we're live. It's official. Holy crap. <laughs> here with. There you go. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. There we go. I can hear you. I can hear you now. All right. Yeah, I lost you for a second. How are things? What's going on? Great, great. I appreciate you having me on and uh, working around my schedule. It's been an interesting time trying to get this finalized. And uh, so, again, I appreciate you jumping on tonight and knocking this out. Absolutely, man. You're a, you're a very popular guy. That's, <laughs> that's what we're finding, right? <laughs> it, so, it's, a good, it's a good thing, that's for sure. <laughs> so the last time I chatted with you, you were out at Elite. You're saying hi, kind of making the rounds over in Ohio, and and we kind of hit it off. We chatted for a while, and you've always been somebody. You've always been a coach that I've really looked up to in the field of strength and conditioning. You've been at the highest level working with you know the Panthers at, a, at you know at a professional level as well as a collegiate level for years and years, and now you have found yourself working with Brian Shaw, right? So yeah. making that big jump into the strongman world. I know, like you probably get this asked a ton. What was it like just getting that call? Just that Brian Shaw just like, hey, man, I need your help. Well, I think people need to know a little bit of the backstory. It's not like it was a cold call. Uh, <laughs> Brian, Brian was in, Brian interned for me in 2005. And mm. so I've known Brian for almost 20 years now. And Brian would have been a very good strength coach, maybe even a great one. Great ones are all determined by the athletes and the teams you coach. I think that we throw around these high titles. Oh, this guy's awesome. This guy's this. <laughs> Slow your roll now because we're, we're, we're very much tied to the teams, the coaches, and the athletes that we coach. So the great Judd Logan told me there's a lot of good coaches that are made great by the athletes they recruit. And that's why I always say uh, your best strength and conditioning asset is your recruiting coordinator, yep. especially, especially at the level you're working at right now. So uh, again, so Brian worked worked with us for a year, and uh, it's an interesting story. But long story short, he came in as an intern, had a couple of opportunities to get him on to other places. It didn't really feel like he wanted that, and then uh, we hired him on as a GA. And then a few weeks after that, right when we were getting ready to enter the regular football season, Brian had to make made a big decision, a big life decision, and that decision was, I think he could see the writing on the wall. I don't know. If he, you know, coaching, especially at the college level, as much as I've learned, don't be all in. It's an all in job. Like when I came up, it was, you got to be into it. This is it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what, man? You, they're, not, they're not as loyal to you as you're loyal to them. I'll tell you that. So there, there's a different, it's a different mindset now. But Brian at that point in time was mature enough to know that he felt like this chase of uh, being a world's strongest man competitor and actually feeling deep down in his heart he had the opportunity to win, I think he could see that the ultimate drive to be the strength coach may have not been what he thought. And I also know he knew the time and effort that's invested on a daily basis. I mean, let's face it, back then we were still training all sports. Mm -hmm. So that's a 12-hour that's a day. And it could be a seven day a week day for at least 40 out of 52 weeks of the year, depending on how you schedule your team. So came to me and said, you know, coach, I, I got, I don't know if I can do this. I really believe I, I see myself being this. And, and what he said was, I see myself being the world's strongest man. And when someone tells you that and they tell you your dream, you, they tell you what their dream and their goal is. And it becomes a reality, not just once, but four times, mm -hmm. I think he made the right decision. And then what you see what he's done, Brian Shaw has proven that you can make a career as a professional strongman. Now, that's a different podcast for a different day. But it, tells, it talks about the testament of who he is as a person, what he's learned over life, how he's used the term branding to a whole mm -hmm. other level in strongman. And you can see how many of the other competitors now are following his lead. So 
when Brian officially calls it the end, I, I believe he'll be even a bigger advocate for the athletes that are competing than he is now. And he'll help take Strongman to a whole nother level because he can now he can put all his effort into the sport, not just competitiveness and chasing wins. And Brian is only going to compete until he until to win. He's not a participant. And that's nothing wrong with what your goals are. Like some goals are, hey, I want to make world's strongest man. That means I'm one of 30 strongest men in the world. Hey, I want to make the finals. Hey, I want to make the podium. That guy competes to win. And, and when, you, when you realize how the game changes and the time, uh, we're all training to beat our birth certificates. Anybody who lives in the weight room is training to beat the birth certificate. Sometimes the birth certificate catches up to you, and sometimes you can push the gauntlet. But when it comes to that type of level, let's just face it. Uh, whether, you, whether you like CrossFit or not, and whether you like Strongman or not, I just said this in an interview this weekend. Strongman competitors and CrossFit competitors have proven a lot about what the human body can do that our exercise physiology books said couldn't be done. So it just shows you, you can never outthink the emotional quotient of the human effort and drive, and the body will adapt to the strenuous efforts if you are able and capable to do that. Not every human being is going to be the world's strongest man. Not every human being can do what they do as professional CrossFitters. But what these individuals have shown you, just like Roger Bannister did when he broke the four-minute mile, is if someone can do it and show you it can be done, other people will strive for that. I mean, I'm sure if you talk to Dave, uh, I remember when I started in powerlifting, you know, pulling 800 pounds was like the mythical number. Uh, yep. Very few guys threw 900. And then uh, the 400 kilogram uh, deadlift was huge. And then Brad Gillingham does a double overhand hook grip. And then all of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, 400 kilograms ain't no big deal. Now everybody does it. 165 pounders do it. And I don't care if it's mm -hmm. sumo gear or not. The, the, the mind is, I can do this. So... Mm. We, we, and that's, uh, you know, we can go into all, I can go all over the place. And that's one thing that I consistently talk about when we talk about sports science and what's going on in the universities and the professional organizations and way. Hey, that date is important. There's no one else going to deny it. There's a lot of great things that we can get from what they call sports science. But the truth is never underestimate the will of a human being. Absolutely. And it's funny, like as a, a strongman competitor myself, like even when I first started, what a, a local meet looked like versus nationals versus the higher level versus what the pros were doing. Like a, a 300 pound log when I first started as a middleweight was like, holy shit, like this is like, that's a big weight. Yeah, now they're doing I, 180 kilograms. Absolutely. Yeah, and you, and the you see the, yeah. And you see the big guys throwing crazy weights around and it's, and, and it, one of my biggest connections with Brian Shaw was I was one of his first members of his first like $5 a month pay site that he oh, did like cool. years and years and years ago. And I remember like just being able, and I thought that was the coolest thing. And he was breaking ground then. This was 10 years ago, 12 yeah. years. It was a long time ago. And he was really breaking ground when it came to, you know, connecting with the audience and branding himself and building up something with the sport. And I just remember being like, how come nobody else is doing this? You could have a direct conversation. You could put your program in there and he would take a look at it and give you pointers and whatnot. And, uh, and it, it's, it's just really, been absolutely phenomenal. And now he's evolved. You know, he runs three businesses out of his warehouse on property. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of that's uh, much credit to Kerry, his wife. His wife's the yeah. dominator. She's in the hustle just like him. He gets his kids involved. He's showing his kids how to work ethic. They'll be mm -hmm. in the weekend helping him. They pack their own packages right on site they ship everything on their own so it, he's just trying to show his kids the work ethic that helped him become who he is mm. so it's been a really good to watch this maturation process but to go back to your original question uh so i've always hit brian up after almost every one of his major competitions and he was having some hamstring issues and and, and it was happening more and more on his deadlift. And there were certain things I would, again, we, we actually helped teach him how to deadlift 
in 2005 in my garage at Ar in Arizona, Gilbert, mm -hmm. me and Ben Hilgert. And uh, now it's funny because I always say, what can, what can I tell you? I deadlift 500 and you deadlift a double, double me. And I'm telling you what to do right or wrong. But <laughs> Brian's still a student of the game. And I always appreciate the fact that he listens. Sometimes he's too coachable. But so I was just hammering him down. And he had just, you know, pulled his hamstring again at the last Arnold he competed in. And I think he was going through a rough patch. And I was just walking him through some texts. And then he reached out and said, hey, what do you think about coming on to the team as my coach? Well, I mean, first of all, it kind of knocked me back a little bit because, I mean, here's the strongest man in the world, someone who's going to go down in the conversations as either the best or one of the two best with Big Z. And, mm -hmm. and people will throw in Pujanowski because he won five world's strongest man's titles. But it generally has been talked about most of the time it's Brian or Big Z. And mm -hmm. here he is asking me to be a part of the team. And it was extremely humbling. And at that point in time, you know, I work now in a different role in athletics with uh, dynamic fitness and strength. So not necessarily doing a lot of coaching, more, more talking about coaching. So the fact that I could get my hands dirty a little bit again uh, really has been helpful for me. My wife knows it and gets me excited. She she knows how I was pretty excited to get out there and work with those guys. And what I, what I found even more impressive is when I'm around the guys that come in and train with him that I don't, I don't overstep my bounds. I know what the role of the strength coach is, but the fact that here's some of the greatest strong men in the world and they don't know me from a shit handshake, but they're willing to at least listen to the conversation. So I, I've been very, very fortunate that Brian's brought me in because it's really opened up. Uh, I've have a little. I have a lot of good niche networks because of my powerlifting career, also, and being around weightlifters and things like that. But now to be within the the intricacies of the strongman world at this level, again, just very thankful that Brian brought me on and had this opportunity to watch him chase the last one, the drive for five. This is our version of the last dance. And the great thing is it's in Myrtle Beach, so it's in the States. Mm -hmm. It's close to me. Uh, I'm fortunate because I have a condo about 40 miles from the event, so I'll base out of the condo and, and be there every morning for him, just like we were last year in Sacramento. So we're all excited. Uh, training's going very well. We had a hell of a weekend. It's always good when you watch these pros compete against each other. They just bring out the best of each other. Uh, the camaraderie of what they do is very, very – exciting and then to have terry hollins there who terry's been there from the beginning of brian's world's strongest man career so he's seen it and tend to listen to him give feedback because he's watched brian every year so he's seen brian go from you know the young before he was the massive 430 pound giant to, and and watch his athleticism at then then he had to go into the monster game because the game changed and now to come back a little bit more to the athletic side and to listen to Terry, Terry's comments this weekend made me feel like, okay, we're in a very good spot with approximately seven. We're at, uh, excuse me, we're at nine weeks right now. So we're nine weeks out, really got six, six massive training weeks left. One, what we call a, a final run through, then we'll taper mm -hmm. and then Brian will fly out to Myrtle Beach with his family. Now, when you're out there this weekend, obviously, like what you guys are doing is, is that's all your business. But when you're surrounded by those professionals in that situation, how do you like there must be a certain amount of competitive drive that those guys just turn on and it's going to be real hard to reel them back in. I imagine that you guys had a game plan going into the weekend. But was, it, was there any point where you're like, hey, we got to save some of the gas in the tank. Like now is not the time to be going crazy with it. Or was everybody just kind of locked well, in on what they were doing? Oh, there's definitely pushing, right? It's just, a, it's the competitive. But the one thing about Brian is Brian's extremely meticulous to a point where sometimes it's a hindrance. And the great thing about Graham, Graham's the same way. So mm -hmm. they move some really good pounds compared to what it looks like could be the weights at the finals, but also knew where that's it, shut it down. We still got a long way to go. So 
the competitiveness is is the drive to go against each other uh, and then the, the, to stand back and talk it, talk it out a little bit, talk a little bit strategy, uh, you know, because Brian, Brian's one of the fortunate ones that pretty much has every piece of equipment that's going to be done at World's Strongest Man in either his gym at the home base or his mountain gym in Estes Park, which is about an hour away. So Brian has a uh, uh, 11,500 square foot warehouse on property that has a 4,000 square foot home gym and then tied to it his podcast room offices and warehouse for his companies. And then at Estes Park, he has a 2,000 square foot barn gym. And that was, if most people, if they follow Brian, that's where they did the second day of the original Shaw Classic in uh, 2020. 2020. Yeah, so it's it, it's, uh, it's it's been pretty cool. Yeah, and it's been really cool to see how Brian has been showcasing his training with his videos and just kind of giving you a little bit of an insight on the things that he's done to shift that more athletic base. Now, if you were to compare strongman to any sport you've ever worked with, is there anything that's relatively close to what they have to do? Not obviously not the pounds or the weights, but in, in, in like the actual training foundation. Um the take the events out and i'd say because you can you can call a clean and press a clean and jerk but mm -hmm. i would say because everything's related to strength and strength relates to certain things i would say in my in my true belief the closest thing you get is is a really good throwing program if you're coaching mm -hmm. uh throwers in track and field there, those guys are competing in the weight room with the similar state of mind that a strongman is because it's been shown that if high level shot putters can bench this type of weight, they're going to throw this. It's been shown that if you can do certain things in the weight room, the hammer, like working on protraction and reach. I think that uh, Bert Sorn told me this because my son was a hammer thrower that for every inch you can extend in protraction to get leverage is like another foot in the hammer. So wow. there's things that happen. Uh, so the weight room and its correspondence to greatness on the throwing circles is very similar to what the weight room brings to strongman. Now the events are event specific, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as you know, as a strongman competitor and what I've learned specifically over the last year with Brian is in strongman, a deadlift, not a deadlift and a press isn't a press because of all the different height starts, whether it's a log an axle a sear dumbbell, uh, you know, what the height is at the start. Is it a heavy flex bar? Is it a stiff bar? So there's a lot of things. And then if you're using an apparatus, right, there's a difference with if it's a cylinder round, apparatus versus a box because it's going to land different uh, a cylinder you can roll a box you have to reset your feet so mm -hmm. all this comes into strategy is it a car deadlift is it a rack is it a rackable squat where the foot position and the starting position is so critical because the angle of pull changes or the angle of the squat presses so that's where knowing the events is early as you can get them is a definite benefit for strongman. You know, we had one of our amateur athletes that was with us this weekend that trains with Brian is going to the Arnold amateur. And one of the events was a mystery event that just gets announced two weeks out. And let's face it, if it gets announced two weeks out, you're not training it. Yeah. You're already into that. Hey, it's time to back off and get your mind right for two days of destruction. Because the Arnold is a static-based event compared to World's Strongest Man. Mm. It's always heavy, too. It was always having the heaviest yoke. It always had – it was insane. The, yeah, the they don't, they they don't want you there. moving much. They want to see how yeah. – they'd rather you do a 1,500-pound, 10-meter yoke than a 
900 for 50 or 60 feet. Right, exactly. So one of the, one of the things that I think having the strength and conditioning background that you do and being able to really dissect the movement of your athletes, understanding weaknesses, understanding how they can get better at their sport in particular, that must have played a huge part of just understanding how to program for Brian. Because on, on paper, it's like, wow, this guy is unbelievably strong. But you as the coach or you as the person that's helping him get ready, you have to be able to break down those numbers, break down that technique and understand how to build those, right? Yeah, I think well, I learned a couple of things last year. Uh, last year was different because we really got an early start. He was only competing in World's Strongest Man. So we had a long – we were rebuilding a deadlift. And when you're rebuilding a guy who has a specific, unique technique and he's, a, he's pulled a 1,000 pounds in multiple different arenas – in multiple different types of deadlifts, it, it goes back to what Eddie Cohn said. You've only got so many max effort lifts in your life. Save them for the meat. So the, the rebuild last year was very conducive to exposing him to a lot of exercises that were not in his pool. Like, I think if you saw a lot of his video, he was doing hip thrusts. Mm. He was doing sumo deadlifts. He was doing vert pull deadlifts. And everything on that was to build areas that could show weakness because he was having hamstring issues. Some of it was technical. Some of it was, uh, you know, just getting a, a little bit out of groove, having energy leaks, uh, too much flexion in the elbow as he's rolling the bar into him, hips rising too hard, not getting the flex out of the bar. And this is the greatest of all time, still having to figure these out. So last year was a different programming than this year uh, one thing i will tell you that i learned too is especially on event days there's a lot i would say the the higher and you would you know this too you've worked at elite seen the greatest of the greatest power lifters come in you train as a power lifter and a strong man what i learned is two things in the year strong man training when it comes to a coaching staff is no different than any sport you have a strength and conditioning coach and then you need an event coach. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you may need a specific event coach if there's a weakness. So this year, the plan was more Brian serves as the head coach and the event coach a little bit. And then I'm the strength and conditioning coach. And I'm the assistant event coach as far as giving him ideas of what the volume should be. Mm -hmm. But really... And I think you know this, when it comes to events, a lot of it's auto-regulated. A lot of it is, if you got it that day, you go for it, because yeah. you may not have it the next week. I mean, I don't want to speak out of turn, but you know, you, know, I've seen several times, I like Martin, Martin Lisi sees videos. You know, one day he'll get broke off at 825, and the very next week he hits it for five. That's what happens in Strongman. You just got to cross your fingers that the week of the event, you're on fire. So... At early on in a strong man's career, I think you can use math. And when I talk about math, I talk about percentage-based cycles, uh, uh, Prilipin's chart, et cetera. The older they get, I think you set specific ranges for their events and their big lifts, and then they just go on how the, how the rhythm of the workout is. Like you said, we had, an, we had a script – for Friday's lift, because Saturday was an event, but you could tell the energy was different. Uh, so we we changed the reps up and pushed it a little heavier because we could. And it worked out really well for both myself and Brian, and then Graham Hicks put on a show in the pressing mm -hmm. event. So it was fun to watch that. And Graham was really happy with that because in his training, and I don't want to speak for him, but it doesn't seem like he'd been doing a lot of horizontal pressing work and we use a closed grip as part of our accessories on mm. Friday. So it was really impressive to watch this guy smoke some pretty big weight. Now, is it, you know, I mean, again, it for a strong man, it's big weight. And I think Graham, if he trained uh, in a full powerlifting mode and he has a powerlifting background, he, he could easily bench, uh, 600 pounds raw or maybe even seven, 300 kilograms because he, he is built to be, he's built like a power lifter doing strongman. 
uh, extremely, yeah. extremely statically strong. It was really impressive. What and got a burst and got some power. Like he can move in the moving events. It was pretty impressive to watch. So yeah, I, I think. Uh, but then the your so as the strength coach, the volumes of the accessory lifts, uh, when to push, uh, looking at different movements of. You know, like Brian's got movements that he really likes, so we want to save those to the end so we don't burn out. So I call a, I call it almost a controlled conjugate where, you know, it's not a weekly rotation of exercises. It's, it's more of a we, we go in three-week blocks, kind of like I did in college. I learned that, you know, that max effort rotation on a weekly basis just doesn't work with college athletes. They can't adapt fast enough. And we, so we went from a one week, this was in the early 2000s. So we went from a one week to a two week to a three week and found that the three week worked the best because week one, we could get some volume in week two, we can push the weight. And then week three, we could set a new rep max. And that's really big with your your fourth, fifth, and third year guys when they've built the base that they need and they need some more uh, variation. And that's the conjugate method is, so I call ours, a uh, well, all my periodization, I just intermix. I can go all day about that. Uh, everybody wants to say, I do block, I do this. I can guarantee if I saw your program, you're doing a little bit of everything because mm -hmm. that's just the way it is in college athletics. And that's what strongman is. You got to be in shape, you got to be massive, and you got to be strong and explosive. So all that stuff ties in too. So it's a, it's more of just picking the right accessories at the right time. And, and the biggest thing is I'm, I'm a sounding board. Like he's got somebody now where he can bounce ideas off. And then I throw uh, – I've learned more about asking questions. Like I told Brian last year, and I believe this as a strength coach, he brought me on to win. We didn't win. That's on me. I have to protect the athlete. So mm -hmm. regardless of what we all know, on the end, I'll protect him. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'll protect the athlete, especially in the individual sport. This year, the line of communication is so much better because right off the bat, we define the roles better. So the communication is very, very much better. And again, that's growth, right? Uh, you bring me up, you know, it's just a, uh, I, and I and I, at times I thought Brian was too coachable last year. If I was doing when I did my debrief, <laughs> I felt like man he was too coachable. Because after that, getting ready for the Shaw Classic, he brought stuff up, and I'm like, "Damn, mother effer, you should have told me that about <laughs> four months ago." So it's it's all a learning process, and again, it's been awesome. Uh, it's really it's really helped me uh, as a coach because when you're a coach, you're a coach. And Absolutely. to be able to coach, even though I'm only coaching one person, it's a pretty good person to coach. I'd have to, I'd have to agree with that. And yeah, you're, you've, based on our conversation that we had back at Elite, I, I brought some questions for up for you, and it was amazing to hear just how open you were to that experience to learn yourself. And and I think that's one of the biggest parts of being the best coach possible is realizing that Brian Shaw knows Brian Shaw better than anybody else on the planet somehow we have to, you know, figure out a good plan, a good strategy based on the information and knowledge that he has from his own experiences to, you know, continue to build and to grow. But even like just the thought of someone that can pull a thousand pounds, you, you can't, they have their own rule book. Like there's nothing, well, there, <laughs> that's all, yeah, I mean, here, it's a, hard to follow that. And here's a great example. And I learned this from Dave Tate years ago when Dave was, Dave helped me out squat my all time best. Dave's given me a, a, a very cool, like I tell everybody all the time, when you look at my tier system and we describe it, tiers four and five are your major assistance work. And when you look at the exercises and I was describing it to Dave, Dave said, oh, that's strength mobility. So we call tiers four and five strength mobility because of Dave Tate. So, but Dave, I mean, Dave told me this and that's why uh, coaching strongman is a lot hard too, because Dave always said it's, when you're coaching the strength sports, it's hard to coach individuals who are stronger than you because you don't have a uh, capability to understand loads. Like, mm -hmm. I can coach most college and pro guys. Even though some may be stronger than me, they're still within a strength level that I know. But when you go into 
powerlifting and strongman, it's just, it's just numbers you can't fathom. Like, you know, I'm writing out scripts and we'll say like last year, we'll say, Hey, we're going to take 675 for a couple of sets of five. And I'm like, man, that's a lot of weight. And then I'm like, shit, that's 67% for this dude. Right. Like, so those are the things that where I really believe Dave was right. Like, it's hard to fathom a number that I can't get for one. And these guys are doing for sets of 10 with an apparatus in a meet. So that's again, why there needs to be that real concentration of listening to the athlete because they know where to push and they know how to set the numbers a little bit better than you on that climb. And it's funny because Unless you're, you, you know, sometimes if you're not feeling it, you back off. But a lot of these guys, from what I can gather, just listening in the, like, locker room, they stay kind of on a linear progression with their events. I'm sure you see that a lot when you're talking to strongman. And um, so it's kind of, in, again, it's interesting. Everybody wants to talk about all this and all that. And the truth is, man, you're just grabbing and plugging, uh, you know, uh, we saw what the West Side Method did for a lot of power lifters, and we saw what linear periodization did for Eddie Cohn. I mean, right. <laughs> and that's how I started. I started, you know, hey man, we're going to do 10s, 8, 6, 5, 5, 3, 3, 95% for one, taper, go to the meet. No, no, no deloads, no nothing. It was 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, taper, go to the meet. You know, and it's so. funny, and you mentioned that because I had Bobby Thompson on uh, a few months ago. He was talking about his training and his pressing is unbelievable. Yeah, he's and he was freak. saying how how simple his programming is. It's yeah. just just get a little bit better every single week and build up to the meet. Like at, when you're at that level, you don't need people. I think people think that there's this magical formula of training and programming that you know gets you miraculously better yeah. all the time but it's really just the hard work and really dedicating yourself to the process of building and learning and growing that gets people to where they're at and i mean shit brian's been doing this for how such a long time yeah. he's the same age as me because when he started his, his pro debut i was competing and i'm like this fucking guy <laughs> is my age i was like how what the hell is going on here but it's well, the- yeah, I think like Bobby said, you got to remember, man, strong is strong. Like, you know, you've been in elite for those crazy uh, seminars mm-hmm. Dave hosts and these dudes roll in. And again, gear or no gear. Like, those dudes, the guys like Chuck Vogel pulling in, them guys are fearless. They don't, they're attack mode. Like, guy like me, I'm meticulous. So I could never, I was never gripping and ripping. I'm like, got it, especially after I got hurt. It's like, yeah, every time you walk under a bar, it's like, are you going to blow your back out again, brother? You got to lock it in, man. You know, fill the fill the boiler up. Get the get the fish gills blowed out. Use you know the whole nine, man. And but some of these dudes are like, boom. And I'm like, don't you know they ain't warming up. You know they're they're out. Hey, what's t- tell me when it's 500? I'm ready. I'm like, must be nice because I'll need about 12 sets to get to 500. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's been my experience jumping into multiply gear is is the weights that you're playing around with on a weekly basis. If I were to look at those as like a raw lifter, I'm like, holy shit, like this is, that's a lot. But then again, it's the whole technical side of things of, of using the gear and the same sort of thing in strongman is you can, if you're having a bad technical day where something just doesn't feel locked in, you're not going to be able to hit the same numbers you could once everything's locked in. And that kind of goes to your point of when you have it and you're feeling good, you got to hammer it. Because you know you don't know if it's going to be there next week. You don't know what's going to be like there the next time, especially if it's. And a, that's the same thing too. Like, yeah, and you should yeah, do you that. Know. Like you know, we we did that in college too. Like we had we had like we were a huge. I'm I'm almost finished with a course on Prilipin's chart, how to use it for college athletes, and and I and I and I'm not patting myself on the back, but my charts are probably as legit a Prilipin charts as anybody's ever seen, and. But we used to have like competitive off the script weeks on Prilipin. Like uh, we would do different depending on your levels. We we were big, you know, eight, ten doubles in that, you know, that high, that high to optimal range from 80 to 88 percent on Prilipin. You know, we'll rock ten doubles at 88, but at set five, if you're rolling, 
we're going off the script and we're doing 3% jumps and we're going to set a PR double. And then on, uh, on our load week, depending on how the cycle's written, we would do a repetition. We would do a repetition contest at the last set. So if it was uh, like we were doing a four week wave where 88% and it was a performance cycle. So it'd be 88. The D load would be 73. Then it would be 82, 76. So like on that 82 week, that last set, even though it might've been eight doubles, that last set, you're doing max reps. Uh, for the squat, we capped it at 10. For the bench, we capped it at 15. And we never did reps for the clean. So, mm. but, I mean, but on squat and bench, man, we're pushing the gauntlet because uh, I believe in, in you got to strain. Like nowadays with velocity based by 10 sets, oh, you're not going at 0.4 no more. We got to shut you down. Well, that ain't how sports play. Uh, mm. I may need you for 10 plays. I may need you for 20 plays. So I got to see you strain. Uh, the number will help me see what kind of conditioning you're in. And I can repeat that workout to see if you can maintain more force production longer. But uh, I think that we have to remember who we're training. We're training athletes who, whether you want to call it or not, and I, I'm a you know, nomenclature, people can get all pissy, but we, 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 most of the sports we coach are power, are power endurance sports. Their power capacity is huge. Football players are going to play 75 plays a game over a three-hour time period. They've got to be in condition, and there's not a coach I've ever met that says, let's beat them in the first quarter and hold on for dear life in the fourth. Because those are the coaches that if they're that guy, they're getting fired, and so are you. It's always the opposite. And that's how we started uh, the tier system early on was – before we knew anything about dynamic effort method and rate of force development, and we were using, you know, explosive, allegedly explosive lifts, but we were moving those around at different points of the workout to see if guys could maintain or women could maintain uh, explosive movements under states of fatigue. Now, I'm not doing a full clean and jerk at tier five, but a dumbbell snatch, uh, a dumbbell power pull, and then it became more jumping as the athletes advance, but that's the way we train. And that's what we've proven that worked because when we got into our jumps, I mean, we go out and do a 35, 40 minute linear speed session, come in clean, front squat, dumbbell bench and row, uh, a clean, uh, then we go jump and guys that set PR box jumps, PR long jumps and PR three, three hop jumps because that's the way we train. Like people would call me a liar. I go, come in and watch, I'm not lying. I have nothing to lie about. I mean, all I'm doing it. And then when I learned, and then uh, Chip Sigmund just did a terrific co uh, presentation uh, this January uh, about complex training. And, and, you know, most people think about contra contrast or complex training as, you know, paired exercises. But there is some cer certain component where doing jumps and doing things like that is a different type of potentiation. So... Mm -hmm. There, there's a, it, it, it's a, I have to study it more before I act, make myself sound a fool. But even though I jumped later than I cleaned and I front squatted, and that was usually a dynamic effort front squat. So there was some possibilities that there was some potentiation types of effects from a clean and the dynamic effort front squat after a minimal, you know, a short break for this, the use session to come back and do jump. So again, man, it, it, all I know is what it proved. Like we just said, you train, the body adapts. If your if your programming is right, you're going to get the athletes better. That's really not all that matters. And if you can see success by improved uh, performing uh, uh, individual uh, KPIs in the strength and conditioning program, hopefully with the combination of a great position coach or event coach, that increases their their on-field performance, and then you win. So it's a combination of a lot of things that people don't really want to talk about. And there's, there is a, I've always said this, whether you like the tier system, whether you like west side, whether you like this side, the, if, the, that's the greatest thing about training athletes. There's no specific way that matters because strength and conditioning and everything we're doing is always second to the sport. 
So that's why you can see people excel at the sport who are awful in the weight room. I coach, not that they were awful, but I coach, I'm going to coach two Hall of Fame NFL football players that were not very strong in the college weight room. And, but they were the two best practice players I ever coached in college. So right. what do you want? What do you want? You want football player? And that's why, like I talk about with exercise technique, I need competent lifters who are competitive athletes. I don't need competitive lifters who are competent athletes or I'll be, I'll be out of the building. So yep. these are the things that you have to understand. It's good because I'm learning every day. Like I tell people, I'm a professional athletic-based strength coach. And I'm a very good level. I can get you to level two powerlifting. <laughs> then you're going to need to go see a professional powerlifting coach. Right. Uh, with my role with Brian, I'm a strength and conditioning coach. And he's the event coach. So that's why it works. And we have other people that help him that know a little bit better about events than I do because they compete full time as strong men. I can look at like weaknesses. Like I can watch a press and know, okay, that's tricep issue or that's a shoulder issue or that's a positioning issue when he's lapping the bar. But as far as the overall things, and then I know how to get that part stronger. Hmm. So, well, I, 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 th I think uh, one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to start this podcast in the first place was to be able to have these sort of conversations with, with guys like yourself and coaches like yourself that are, really have, have done this for years and have been able to see amazing athletes at all levels. So there are a lot of people that listen to this that don't necessarily have a coaching or a, you know, or a training background and they're just kind of meatheads or they're athletes themselves. What are some of the tools? And you had mentioned this, like how strongman is shifting to that more athletic base, moving events, to just higher conditioning levels. What are some of the tools that you've used with Brian or just in the past with football players, with all your athletes to raise up that level of athleticism if they're coming in deconditioned? Yeah. I mean, you know, athleticism's hard. I mean, that's genetics. Like uh, a stiff guy is going to be stiff. You can get him somewhat better with, you know, mobility types of drills, you know, and that's very standard. I mean, I, I, I like, uh, I've adapted a lot of uh, Mike Robertson's type of programming terminology so for me, it, in the off off seasons and every – and Louis Simmons proved this with extra workouts and sled dragging, right? Mm -hmm. I think he was the first one who said powerlifters need to be in shape too. You don't need to be in the weight room three or four hours a day. Now, strong men on event day, you're going oh, yeah. to the, gonna be in there three or four hours. So you need some conditioning. So from, from, from my standpoint with well, – well, let's keep it to the – we'll just keep it to non-athletes. Like we're talking – excuse me non-team athletes will consider this this answer more for the strength discipline athletes so your strong men power lifters weight lifters uh and bodybuilders need a little bit different more conditioning for fat burning but let's just keep it to the three sports that are highly explosive one rep based stuff uh, i think there's something to be said about doing what we call resiliency or work capacity work at the end of your workouts and it's nothing more it's the simplest one I can recommend is 12 minutes, 15 seconds on, 45 seconds off. Uh, I just finished right before I got on with my workout. I did Versa Climber Sprints, uh, 15 seconds, 45 for 12. Uh, air dine work, uh, just stuff like that. Med ball slams. Uh, I did a Tabata method over at Brian with the endless rope. I mean, just things like that to build conditioning. Uh, even like light, when me and Brian started last year, we were building up to where we did uh, 12 reps on the minute of a very light farmers, and we worked up to 20 EMOM. Same thing with a light yoke. So all you can take your strongman work early in your season and use a light weight. Like for Brian, I think he's using a 600-pound yoke, and he worked up to 20 50-feet sprints on the minute. So – that's resiliency for sport. And I think that kind of stuff works for linemen also. But early on, you want to – and early, like right now, if I was with the NFL again, most of the guys would be off their feet conditioning, doing these types of work. Uh, more of that what I call meathead metabolics, make it fun before they have to put the cleats on and get in the grass. And then you hope that that capacity builds up because, as you know, once they get – 
like, like for example, I won't speak for the loads, but I think those guys did like 10 reps of Conan's wheel. Now it wasn't, you know, the distances didn't matter. It's 10 reps, you know, it's 10 reps of Conan's, you know, they did multiple, multiple singles at the single fingers, multiple, a uh, couple of three stone runs at the, at the, uh, at the stones. And then they followed that with a, you go, I go, Ema, you know, as, as fast as possible, five reps. So uh, Brian's in, Brian, I think, has adapted well to that. And then, and then we do simple stuff, like we do mini hurdles. We do foot ladder. And I don't do – we're not doing foot ladder to get faster. We're doing foot ladder for foot speed because mm. we have a lot of moving events this year. And as you know, Sam, most of the times when you pick up a yoke, or you pick up a farmer's, you pick up a Conan's, you're carrying a Husafeld, it's very short, fast steps. So to me, there's merit in the basic ladder drills mm. <laughs> to just get the feet to pop, 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 because that's the cadence you're going to see most of the time when these guys go. Uh, short little lateral stuff with mini hurdles to help with change of direction on your loading. So we do... Um, uh, a, a lot of good, a, a good one for strongman is a 60 yard shuttle, five and back, 10 and back, 15 and back, really working on plant burst and pivot pivots. Uh, I, I really like that. But again, every, it's up to the coach and it's up to the athletes. See, Brian being a former basketball player, a lot of these drills are not new to him. So for him, mm. no big deal. Just something to get re-exposed to. For athletes who not, you're like, why am I, F it's like anything else. Why do I need to lift weights? I'm scoring 20 points a game. Well, you're going to score 20 until you get hurt because you're not strong enough to play 35, 40 games in college or 82 games in the NBA. So it, there, you have to learn. What I've learned with athletes that strength is – the strength and conditioning program is no higher than – hell, for some it's third or fourth. But it's never going to be higher than second. You got to find out what makes them tick and then use that to get them in. Like for some, it's not, hey, man, you're in a position that you don't need to be bigger, faster, stronger. You're already there for your position. But let's make you more durable. Let's mm -hmm. make you more robust. Let's make you more resilient. Let's hang. Let's train the damn heads. Let's train the neck so we you don't get head trauma. Let's train the ankle. Let's train the hamstring. And then build out these, you know, what Louie calls extra workouts and what Matt Wenning calls winning warm-ups. I mean, you can use a winning warm-up as a resiliency package for athletes. Hmm. High volume work for certain parts of the body, and then you're building up the tendon and ligament uh, durability to play sport. And then you got to change the tempos. That's why, like, people laugh when I think it was Juji Mufu was out training with Brian, and Brian's doing flutter kicks. Well, you know that has merit. It's a high, fast impact on the hamstring that's going to happen in a meet. Uh, rapid fire banded uh, leg curls. Mm. There, there's merit in that stuff when you really look at certain things in the weight room because you can't just train slow. You can't just train eccentrically emphasis uh, and then do a maximum concentric acceleration. You got to find other things to do. That's why I like throwing med balls. Sometimes it's better than Olympic lifts. Doing med ball slams for your core instead of doing a friggin' crunch. You know, doing... Yeah lateral toss t tosses into the wall like like we're doing a lot of chops and lifts because the conan's wheel is a brace you got to mm. lock the obliques in I, I think there's merit in that we're going to have to do a sear dumbbell chops and lifts get the oblique strong uh powerful chops and lifts that's where my that's where my expertise as a strength and conditioning coach can come in it's like why are you doing that and then when you tell them well in the dumbbell you're going to be here. And it's almost turned into a bend press. I don't need my guy tearing a serratus on when he, we need to do a big sear dumbbell to win the event. You know what I'm saying? Single yeah. fingers. I don't need the guy over rotating uh, because those things get heavy real fast. Mm. And those are, th those are really good examples of, of that resiliency that you want to build. And it's amazing to see, I think a lot of people when they're watching these big guys do compete at the world's strongest man, that they just think that it's just get bigger and stronger all the time, but you have to break these things down because you, like, just like, you know, anytime you have an athlete, that's all power and no breaks, they couldn't stop. Like that's when bad shit happens. So 
it's, it's really cool to hear how you sort of break down those lifts from your coaching expertise and your experience and understanding the human body, which again, Brian is a very intelligent guy. He has a great background. He's worked under you. Like he's learned a ton, but to have that outside resource, especially when you're focused on just training, right? It must be so refreshing for him to be able to walk into the, and train yeah, just and just, the just compete, <laughs> just compete. Right. Well, like, yeah, the cool thing too is like because when you know we were one of the first guys to go all in with the band with the Dick Hartzell era in the early 2000s. So when Brian came to intern with us, bands were a big part of our warm up. Brian was the first strongman to bring bands to a meet to warm up. Nobody warmed up. The guys from overseas smoke a couple of cigs, go yeah. through a few reps, bounce out. You know, Brian's in there doing like a dynamic warm up to get ready. And now, hey, like I saw. Last year before the truck pull, I think Romark pulled out like a small variation of a run rocket to help Martin Martins run warm up for the bus pull. So mm -hmm. everybody's understanding, man, there's a lot of things going into this package that makes a big impress that that's impressionable on people. So and again, a lot of it stems from Brian Shaw. I mean, I don't I don't say that because I'm on his team. I say that because I've seen it. I've seen the YouTube that I've seen how that started. Like you said, he was doing things before it was even smart. And now mm. he's smart enough to realize that, Hey, if I'm going to pump somebody else's product, I might as well just pump my own. Right. And now he, and now he's a business owner and, and he's doing very well with three successful businesses and, and runs a, and you know, in just three years, you know, as a strong man fan, the Shaw Classic is now one of the best, one of the top four events in the world. Yeah. And it's and this year we're doing an expo. So we're going to have an expo uh, the day before to start it. Oh, that's awesome. So that's going to be cool. Uh, right now, I'm fortunate I'm going to speak. Eddie Cohn's speaking right now. And I think there was a couple of more uh, athletes that Brian reached out to. If they come, it'll be a really good variation of, of people. And then – I'm going to guess I'll ref last year. I felt like the odd man out because last year, the four refs were Chad Coy, Mark Phillippe, uh, Van, Van Hatfield. So all these dudes had competed in worlds. Mark was America's world's strongest man. Van was terrific. And Chad just came in, I think fifth at OSG 50 plus. And then here's me. And I'm like, odd man out. And they're all like, well, it's you, man, your house. And I'm like, yo, brother. <laughs> You're, this is I'll just sit back and be I'll be over here I'll be second team so Mark and Chad kind of ran the show and but it was awesome to be a part of it and then to watch Brian come in second in an event where he's got to be host problem solver uh, event captain him and his wife man it was incredible so yeah I, I'm, I'm really fortunate to watch that grow and the Budweiser Center out there I think you know tickets are already for sale I'm not trying to pump it I'm just telling you, it was a cool event because if you watch overseas, how they fill those stadiums overseas, mm -hmm. uh, Brian and Kerry, what they did last year at the Budweiser Center, like for the last night of the finals, uh, we used half of the event. It's, a, it's like a minor league hockey facility, so one of those types of sizes. But I, I guarantee you there was 4,000 plus for the finals. And you know in America, that's, that's pretty legit. Absolutely. When is that Shaw Classic? When's that going to so be? So that'll be August, uh, the weekend of that 20th. I think it's either the 18th, 1920 or 19, 20, 21. Okay. But uh, it'll be a what the first day will be the expo. And then the next two will be competition. That's going to be awesome. I'm going to have to get grab some tickets and I'll, I'll have to make a trip out there because I've always wanted to see it like ever since he started it. I've always just been a huge fan. I've just been a huge fan of what Brian does not only for the sport, but just in general. It's like he was the first guy that you saw bringing a refrigerator with oh, him no, yeah. to hotels. You know what I mean? Like oh, he's just controlling the controllables. See his whole, yeah, that, that's another that, – uh, I've been in his hotel room last year in Sacramento. <laughs> what, his, what, his, what, he, what he brings and what he orders in from Amazon is a – man, it just shows you behind the scenes the, the financial investment it takes mm. – to be the greatest of all time. It's just so impressive. Like I was in, like, I was astounded. Like 
I'm just making notes about this, you know, what, what he brings, what he requests from the hotel. Uh, it, it's, it's quite, yeah, it's, it's really interesting to be, to say the least. And I, I can mean, only it, imagine what happens when he's overseas oh, and he's got to yeah. ship that stuff overseas. Absolutely. And it's that whole idea of, of just controlling the things you can control. Right. And it, he was he's always, yeah, meticulous about what he eats, what he puts in his body, you know, his sleep, his recovery, his training, just everything locks in and lines up. And I think a lot of people take that for granted when they hear it. They, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm supposed to eat what I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like he, he was able to take that and really just make it his entire life, really. Like his life goal at the time was to just be the world's strongest man and being able to control those things and really put the time in just like as a viewer, as a fan, I'm like, Oh, I got to step up my game. If I want to be even remotely good at the things I want to do. Well, I think too. And I think, and I, I've never really asked him, but I think some of it really, I bet you when you think about it is when you go overseas and some of that country's food. Oh yeah. Could be an issue. And, Water, you know, hey, I don't like it. Like the last thing you want to do is eat the wrong stuff the night before. The <laughs> so I think Ooh. when you go over, you know, to the, some of the places that he's won the events, you want to be really cautious of. I think, and that's where, again, I don't want to speak, but that's where sometimes I've heard like when guys go over overseas to compete, they pretty much try to find a McDonald's because that's yeah. the closest thing to what they they're used to eating until after the event, and then they'll try whatever the local, the local specialties are. Yeah. I, I've heard horror stories of just stomach bugs crawling through yeah. everybody, just horrible, horrible stuff. So no, that's, it's absolutely, absolutely amazing. And uh, I think one of the coolest things as again, a fan of strong man in general and what Brian has been able to do is his impact on the, you know, the amateur level is like, now you're seeing such a rise in performance from the 105 kgs from you know amateur like because they have someone they can look at be like this is something that i can do this is something like you had mentioned earlier the four minute mile like once you see somebody break it now it's like okay now what i can do is learn from that person and develop a plan that helps me get to where i need to be so he's having such a tremendous impact not just at the highest level but even just I know people that haven't even competed in strongman and have no interest in competing in strongman. No, Brian Shaw, like oh, just no. know what he does. Knew know what he does. Knows his YouTube channel. Knows that he was on TV. Knows that he lifts cars. But like, it's it's spreading out to such a large audience that I don't think anybody would have really thought that would be the case. You know, starting out, especially when he was in your office making that decision to not go into strength and conditioning. Mm -hmm. And to go compete in the strong and go into strongman, you must have been there. Must have been a small part of you going, okay. <laughs> like, I mean, but again, hey, who would like? I, I mean, and it's. A, uh, you're, I was telling Kerry the similar story to me. Like when I got into when I when I got into coaching, and I was at Boise State, and you know I played at Wake Forest in North Carolina. My wife's from North Carolina. My parents retired from New York to North Carolina, and then 1995, I'm out in Boise as the head strength coach, and. Mr. Richardson lands the Carolina Panther franchise. And I told anybody who listen is I'm going to be the strength coach of the Carolina Panthers one day. And so to, to live that dream, like to, to work your dream job or like in Brian's case to accomplish that dream, doesn't mean the next adventure isn't great. Like, like if people, if I got a job, uh, you know, like, right, like right now, just to, this is just a different dream. It's a different learning experience working from dynamic. If I got a coaching job tomorrow in the NFL, that's a dream come true to coach in the NFL. But I lived my dream job. Like you hear coaches say it all the time, right? Well, this is my dream job. Then a year later, they go to another dream job. Uh, I'll, I'm a, I'll be honest with anybody that, and I would tell them this in an interview. I've worked my dream job for nine years. The opportunity to coach in the NFL is a dream come true to get another opportunity. I promise you the same efforts. But I mean, I'm not this. I'm not these guys. Oh, I just got my dream job. Oh, I already had that. I had it for nine years. Went to a Super Bowl. I'm I'm good. Like, you know. And then like with Brian, man, he had a he had a dream. He had a vision. He he saw himself on the top of a podium. He started out to see where he could push his body and became the greatest of all time. Uh, I'll tell you a good book to read. And I had him sign it at the Shaw Classic yes last year. 
read uh, Big Z's book, uh, Big Z's biography. I'll tell you what was really impressive was how, how great a recall he has to all the events he'd been at. It's pretty impressive. And then he lists his version of the all-time greatest uh, strength, uh, strength athletes that he's competed against. And, and, and the genuine thing about Big Z was it was kind of cool because I don't, I don't mess with the dudes during the events. Like I wanted Mark Felix's picture so bad at World's Strongest Man because he's my age. And like him and Nick Best are people I really look up to because they're my age doing that. And, and I'm just such a fan of sport to see people the same age as you doing it at that level, at that high of a level is just something that uh, pushes me to do the best I can do at, at my levels. So I waited to the very end because because Mark was in Brian's group. And the very last day I got a picture with, with Mark Felix and that kind of, as much as Brian winning, but that was one of my like go to like, hey man, when this is all said and done, I got to get a picture with Mark. And then with Big Z, I had finished the book, so I said, hey Big Z, you mind getting a picture? And then I said, and signing this book, and you just see this giant <laughs> smile come across. You know, the guy with the most international competition wins in the history of strongman. You know, eight time Arnold winner, four time World Strongest Man winner. What's he, two-time IFSA world champion? I mean, mm -hmm. the list goes on and on. And to see that genuine smile that I would have that book there, because I knew he was going to be there. So I was bringing the book with me. Mm -hmm. I had it at World's Strongest Man. It just didn't work out. But I made sure I was going to get that book signed by Big Z at World's Strongest Man because I just, again, I can appreciate what he's accomplished because it's something mm -hmm. that, a lot of people never thought could be done. And and that's something that I appreciate appreciate about you so much is that regardless of the levels that you've coached or the levels you've been, it's like you're still a fan of the stuff that you're a part of. Like you still can appreciate the efforts of these athletes and you, you just love what you're doing. And I had that chance when I was at Elite, just being able to talk to these people on a daily oh, basis yeah. and, and like learn from them and just being in the same room and just – like most of the time, like I feel bad that I didn't get enough pictures with some of these people for that same then, reason. Again, I will tell you this though, as a coach, you respect their privacy. Like absolutely. Like I, I, I have heart. My, one thing my wife said is like I, my, my kids and myself, I have hardly any real memorabilia from my coaching jobs. Like I have very little. I don't. I only have like two pictures of autographed guys. I don't have any jerseys from any of the guys. I just felt like. That was me overstepping my role as a strength coach, and do it. And now, I now if I called Luke Keekley today and say, "Hey, Luke, I, can you get me a signed jersey?" I'd have it tomorrow, or Thomas Davis, or those guys. But I just never felt like uh, that was kind of my deal. And you're right; there's a lot of things that people would say I missed out, but I didn't miss out anything because it's all right here. And you know, it's, it's just like watching the NFL players as a former player who made it you know, play division one, you, you realize that professional football is not division one football. It's, it's the mm -hmm. level of respect you earn for the football player at the NFL level. It, it just grew exponentially watching it live. Like even in the, my very first preseason game on a sideline, I was like, this is a different deal. And preseason is like pace laps in a NASCAR race. It just revs up, it revs up, it revs up. And then you watch the speed of the game in the regular season. And then if you can only imagine now, you go through, when I was in the league, 16 games in 17 weeks. Now you qualify for the playoffs, and now it ramps up another level. And, yep. and it's just amazing the resiliency of these guys who could just come back week after week after week and play at those phenomenal efforts. And it's just um, – it's just a credit to who they are as people. Uh, they know how to utilize their bodies. They're, they're good listeners. Uh, you know, people, people see certain things outside of the locker room and the weight room and the practice field on some of these guys. And everybody, everybody's earned the right to have their own personality. But if you watch these guys, man, they want to work hard. And again, working hard is defined a lot different at a lot different levels. Mm -hmm. And they want to be coached. And they want to win. So I don't, I don't think sometimes they get enough appreciation for that. And being, being the fact that I got to watch that for nine years, 
uh, I can I can speak to that, and that uh, you know, then I can all you know, and that's one thing I feel very fortunate with my opinions. And most people know I'm extremely opinionated. I reserve the right to be wrong, but I, I just feel like my experiences of where I've been. I've been in the private sector, so I can talk about the private sector. I've been in the pros. I've been at college. I've been at high school. Not many people have hit all four, hmm. so I, I have. I have the ability to speak in fairness at all the different discipline areas that you coach in more so than people who've only been to one or the other, because as you know, especially on social media, there's a lot of like, he said, she said, I would do this if I was there. Or, I would do that if I was there, but you're not there and you've never been there. And I can promise you talking to guys who said that and then went there, they realize that, no, you can't do that because it's a different rules and regulations when you own your own building and it's private versus working for a team with CBAs, specific rules and regulations. And the fact that you're dealing with the athletes who are in a different position than the ones that come to you and pay you to train you. You know, mm -hmm. you can't do a 45 minute dynamic warm up when you only got an hour and a half before meetings in the off season. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. You got thir I got 35 minutes with guys after practice before the special teams meeting. <laughs> you know, I want I want to see you fit in your three hour workout, and that's <laughs> where the that's where the creativity of what I call the organizational or the educational strength coach mm -hmm. is really on point. I think it's I think it's an easier transition to go from the educational or organizational space to the private than the private to the organizational space because. It's easy to go, I think, from a condensed programming to expanded. But when you're used to expanded programming, now you're short for time. It takes you a little bit to really pick what's the most important. I know what the most important is. I also know what I'd like to do. So when I go from, from organizational to private, okay, here's most important. Now, here's all the stuff I wish I could have done with somebody. Now I can do it because time's not a factor. I set right. the session time, <laughs> you know, so yep. it's, it's, it's just interesting. Dynamic. And, and again, everybody can have their own opinion. I, I have mine. And I, I just tell people like, just, just be aware of who's giving you the information. And a lot of times people think that means I don't respect somebody or I don't respect their work because now I don't read that because it just doesn't resonate with me. For I, I respect anybody who's got their name on something because that means they believe it in their heart. I may not have to, I don't, I don't have to look at it to respect it because I know how hard it was for me to put things on paper too. So uh, sometimes I feel like I hear like, oh, house, so-and-so is all pissed off. You don't like them. I said, I like them just fine. I respect them. I said, just because I didn't follow his program or watch it or go hear him speak, it just... I, I look at things differently. And that's why I tell people, you got to be very, very honest with yourself uh, and, and just study what you want. Like I, I, I say it like this. I know what I know. I know what I don't know. I know what I need to know. But more importantly, I'm at a point in my career where I know I don't care to know. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and Absolutely. You, got, and that, you can't get there. That's logging in years. But I know this. I know what I don't know. But you know what the great thing about knowing what I need to know too is? I got a Rolodex of people who are smarter than me that are going to help me on the things I need to know and don't know to help me get the answers. And that's part of being a great coach, right? Knowing who you are, knowing that not everybody has the, all the answers. No one does. Right. So you find those experts in those specific fields and you try to cherry pick them. Like, I can get you faster in a 40, but I'm no track coach. Right. You know, when people are right. talking about back end, front end mechanics, I'm a, I'm a general contractor. <laughs> I would need somebody on my staff that's specifically like their, their number one deal is speed, linear speed. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, you want to talk about like, you know, Hey, is the issue, the ankle, the knee or the hip? Uh, well, it's one of the three, so I'll fix all three, but a physical therapist will know, well, let's dig a little deeper. Hey, it's the hip. So now we can just focus on the hip. You know, yeah. so those are things that you just got to be honest with yourself. Uh, any coach, whether you're in the first year, 
the fifth year, the tenth year, or the thirtieth year, I know what my strengths are. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a leader of large, organized group training sessions with time restraints. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm a, I can. I'm a competent coach on every lift that I bring into our programs. Some of them, I'm a competitive coach. I can really dissect. Uh, but if I'm coaching the strength sports, I know what level I can take you to. And then after that, I got to go, okay, my man, it's, it's my time to find with my Rolodex to get you to the next level. And then with the, with the unique things like strongman, I know what my role is. And I, can, and I can work with elite level strongman because there is a difference between strength and conditioning and events. It's just, oh, like, yeah. it's just like no different than football. There's strength and conditioning, and then there's O-line play. There's strength and conditioning, and there's shooting free throws. There's strength and conditioning, there's flicking a hockey puck. There's strength and conditioning, there's swinging a tennis racket, swinging a golf club, spiking a volleyball. So strong man's a lot like that. Uh, CrossFit, a little bit more strength. You know, the, the events don't change much. But as you notice, since Rogue's gotten more into strong man, strong it's man. It's log. Games, I and, saw it. Yep. They're small. Oh, we're going to carry a sandbag for, you know, we're going to do a yoke walk. And yep. it's funny now. And again, what is that? That's just what we were talking about earlier. No different than Brian training 20 reps at 50 feet on a yoke. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a hell, that's a CrossFit wad. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent coach. I can't, I can't thank you enough for spending some time with me tonight. Um, I'm going to, like I said before, like, I truly appreciate the work you've done, the work you do, and what you do for the, the, the entire coaching world. It's, it's amazing to see the information you put out, all the things you've done in the past, and what you continue to do. And just sharing that education, that knowledge is super, super important. And I know for me, one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to do this was like just to pick your brain, man. Like it's, it's so great to learn from you, to gain some insight onto how you're, you know, developing yourself into that strongman world and really just kind of helping Brian as much as you possibly can. It's really amazing to see, but any last words I have that the floor is yours. If you want to pimp something out, it's all up to you, whatever you got to do. No, again, I, I, I really appreciate you reaching out. Like you said, when we first started talking, a lot of the people you had said mentioned my name, which is always appreciative. And, you know, at this point in my life, man, I mean, I've been successful, like, chasing success and chasing the ring and being a little bit more selfish and arrogant. Uh, you know, that, that stuff comes with sports, right? That comes with chasing, you know, uh, the game of winning. And now uh, even at the end of my career, you know, you get to that point where you've accomplished so much. It's about just giving back and just letting people know the journey is worth it. And, and to know there's a lot of, you know, don't get stuck in like, well, so-and-so does it this way. I have to. No, you don't. Uh, my biggest thing I could tell anybody is, you know, study the history of the game. Just remember, it didn't start with conjugate. It started with Bompa. You know, learn the history of why conjugate works because it all derived from, you know, linear periodization and people got smarter and learned how to manipulate stuff, you know. Uh, whatever, like, again, the periodization of strength is such a crazy, you know, the, the terms that we use is just laughable because, like I said, I can show you a program from 1991 that has everything that we talk about now. Am I concurrent? Am I block? Am I conjugate? Am I, am I linear? Am I this? Am I that? And I'm like, you know, it's like anything else. Like, oh, well, we do this. And I'm like, well, that's tempo-based. That's you know, that's freaking Arthur Jones created a rep tempo when he created Nautilus. What did, it, what did people do? They exploited it. You know, this is, uh, you know, <clears throat> oh, we're going to do EMOMs. Well, hell, Louis Simmons was doing reps on the minute and dynamic effort squat before you even brought up EMOMs, right? And, and, you know, it's just, it is what it is. I mean, Bob Alejo said a lot of things, too, about, like, strength training. He says, and, and he's heard, and I'm sure people have said it before, but, like, Tell me what you call, tell me what it is, and I'll tell you what we used to call it, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and that's just the history. Everybody, it's a recreate stuff. And, you know, some people are fortunate that they were a little bit more innovative. And, and, I, and I've been known to be that in our field to bring concepts to fruition. And fortunately for me, they've resonated with the masses. And, 
it's a very humbling experience to see uh, the worldwide use of the tier system and then a lot of the block zero concepts that happen in high schools and colleges around the nation. And, and again, I'm not, I, I just want to see who's next, like who's willing to take that leap of faith, who's willing to get berated by the so-called experts that you can't train like that, or you can't do this. or that doesn't make sense. Well, nothing makes sense. You know, hell, before there was lifting, they were still playing sports without lifting weights. Mm -hmm. uh, we just made it. We, we made us a career in a field that allows us to enjoy the weight room and to give back in a certain way and help. The biggest thing is just remember this bigger, stronger, faster, whatever you believe in your ultimate goal is to protect the athlete. So just be aware of that, that the number is irrelevant. Uh, I believe in one rep maxes. I believe in getting strong. I believe in jumping high, but that's just crucial to the training, but that number doesn't need to be a bastardized number. Uh, you know, if you can't teach a clean correctly, don't clean. Who cares if every other team in the country cleans? If you don't know, if you don't believe in Olympic lifts, don't do them. Throw med ball, jump on boxes, sprint. You know, I mean, there's other ways to do it. Uh, find, find unique variations of movements that are more efficient to athletes who really don't want to be in the weight room. You know, they're there because they have to be to keep their scholarships and to get paid. I mean, they get paid to work out in the NFL in the offseason on top of their salaries. They get workout bonuses. You know, so I think you just got to be just be uh, very cognizant of what our role is. Mm -hmm. And the real role is, is to be an advocate and a champion to the athlete. And we're a certain like I, I used to not believe like support staff and this and that. Look, look at it this way. We're, we're a service to the athlete. And I don't mean a servant as Donnell Boucher has reminded us. I mean, we serve that. We have a purpose. We're part of their, in the, no different than what I am to Brian. That's what you are in the team setting. You're an individual advocate for the athlete. And once they've built the general co competencies of your program, then it's up to you to see what you can tweak to give them the best abilities that they can. So, you know, again, I, I just enjoy it. I love talking about it. No big deal for me. I can talk all day. I love seeing people at clinics and just chopping it up. And that's a great part of my role now is I get to go to a lot of events, see a lot of people, talk training, look at all the new stuff that's out there, you know, follow you guys at Elite. I mean, Dave's been on top of it for, you know, I mean, I, I owe a lot to Elite, Dave and Tracy. They were they sold my sled tape in 1999 at uh, when I was at Utah. They've sold my book for over 20 years now. So They've always been an advocate of me and I've always been an advocate of them. I mean, I remember when Dave first started in the, you know, in his house and then he had the small little place over on main street with him and Jim and they had the two little bays. And then he had the first compound, the second compound. And then the guy, be, you know, the guy hit so well, he got to be able to build a building from scratch and now owns the building, which as we all know, that's the key in business is owning the real estate. You own the real estate, you always got an asset. And that should be the ultimate goal of most people in the private sector is can you get to a point where you can own the building that you're in? Because I have the utmost respect for people who put their name on products and companies and being in the private sector and just subletting. I, I, I gain so much respect for Ricky Pro to have his name on a, on a 60,000 square foot building because the amount of effort and money it takes to have your name on a storefront and start from scratch is very much a kudos to people. People who, who write books and people who start their own organizations and bet on themselves, I have a high level of respect for. It has nothing to do with the, my, my, my comments or my, res, or my belief in what the product is. I believe in the fact that that guy bet on himself or that woman bet on himself and they're winning because if they're attracting an audience, what does it care what I do? Like, I can respect the audience believes in them. And there's a lot of things that may not resonate with me at this point in my career, but that doesn't mean I don't believe that a lot of people don't need that. You know, and that's what people need to understand, man. Don't, I don't, I, I and again, I put, I, I have no problem telling you I put my foot in my mouth when I talk about certain things, but that's what people have to be aware of. Can you man up and say that? I'm at a point now where I'll make fun of myself and I, I'll tell you flat out, like, hey, man, that's the utmost respect for somebody. 
doesn't mean I'm going to do, doesn't mean I got to believe in what he's saying. Sure. Because when the dude's Absolutely. selling out shows and, and, and women are selling books and they're up on stage and there's hundreds of people listening to them, it doesn't matter if I'm not in the room. Right. Now you got right. your supporters. I mean, it's like, you know, like all these, you know, I can go on all day, so I won't, but hey, uh, whatever I can do for you, I know you're at Rhode Island now and whatever I can do for you guys at Rhode Island, if you ever never even need anything, uh, I'm, I'm just a phone call away. So again, good luck to you. It's been great getting to know you. And like, even then, like, you know, we were talking about just meeting people. That week I was up there, I met Juji Mufu, right? Yep. You, you see the guy on, on the internet, then you talk to him. That guy's one of the best guys I've ever met. Like, and I got, and I got to go see his Taj Mahal 4,000 square foot weight room because he's only about an hour away from me. And that's yep. the thing is what uh, people build relationships. You never know who you're going to meet and you find out how uh, people are behind the scenes and gener when they're genuine and their willingness to look at you and learn and listen and vice versa, that's what this whole game's about. I mean, you know, it's all, I, like I tell people all the time, doing these types of broadcasts, Zooms, texting, uh, that's all great, but don't ever, just remember this, face-to-face -face human action is how you coach, and it's also how you need to learn if you're in the strength game. So if you can get to events, I don't care what event it is, or you can invest your time in the clinics, you, that's, that's the key to this learning process is building your network, people you can lean on, and, and build a strong Rolodex of experts outside of what you know because it takes a team to get the athletes right. Absolutely. Coach, fantastic as always. Truly appreciate you, what you do. For, like I said, it, this has been an absolute pleasure for me. I'm going to cut the recording now, but guys, thank you very much for listening to this one and uh, we'll see you in the next one.